This is Yvette Carnell from Your Black World, and I'm speaking uh, again today to Pascal Robert, um, who is a Haitian American blogger, writer. And today, I really want to just 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 have a conversation about the big news of the week, which was President Obama giving a budget, offering a budget, his first initial, his budget, this is his idea, his budget, in which he says he wants to cut Social Security by chaining it to CPI. Now, this is, for most people, and most people really don't get this, but this is the first time since the whole New Deal era that we've had a Democratic president propose a cut to Social Security. So I, I want Pascal to talk about that in a broader sense, but I also want to just ask him, first of all, um, I just want to ask you, Pascal, how does this, what does this say about how people who describe themselves as progressives or liberals have it, it misunderstood this president, or have they? Okay, uh, Yvette, once again, thanks a lot for having me on the program. Uh, in terms of Obama and Social Security, and as well as Medicare and uh, the change CPI for Social Security, and uh, also the propositions in his budget to means test Medicare, which means that it will uh, allocate Medicare benefits according to income. Those at the higher tier will be considered that the put in more to actually access Medicare benefits, which is problematic as well. There's a really several uh, great articles about that by Paul Krugman talks about why means testing is a problem also. But to understand uh, this chain CPI, which basically means that Social Security, if people don't know, I mean, I'm sure more, many of us know people, uh, grandparents, our parents, even people who are disabled who get Social Security, is that the benefits that you get from Social Security are fixed to inflation so that Every year, they basically take an assessment of what inflation is based on a base number, based on past years of certain products that are fixed at a price, and they compare them yearly. And based on that comparison, they make a decision as to how much to increase the percentage of your Social Security benefits based on what inflation is perceived to be for the that current that current that coming year. Um, this is a logical thing to do, as in most uh, most federal pensions. For example, if you work at the VA, your pension or your, is also uh, inflation adjusted. And it's logical because if you're getting a fixed amount of uh, revenue from uh, Social Security or any pension that is federally that's federally subsidized, if the cost of living is going up because of inflation and you're getting the same amount of money, basically you actually are working against your own interest because you're buying less for the same dollar because the price, you know you, or what costs a dollar. Yesterday is not the same thing that costs a dollar today. So for, traditionally, there's been this constant increase of Social Security based on the inflation. What change CPI does is that basically it changes that to a number based on the lowest tier of, of items you can buy. So it doesn't give you the normal increase that you would get. And this is detrimental because there was an article, there was a blog put on by uh, Doug Henwood, who actually writes for the nation, talking about how chain CPI over a decade can actually take possibly potentially 10% out of people's Social Security. Now, for most senior citizens whose Social Security, the average amount you get is less than $20,000, meaning fifteen and $20,000, it's not a lot of money anyway, um, taking 10% out over time is actually, that's a significant part of, 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 of revenue for them because that could be, you know, you know a phone bill, that could be a, a whole variety of services that they could use that money for. And Social Security has traditionally been the one of the most beneficial and universally uh, beloved and, and, and appreciated uh, programs that came out of the Democratic Party of the New Deal era, started, I believe, in 1934 by FDR for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And uh, it had a profound, profound effect at securing a quality of life for senior citizens that traditionally have been denied that. So in terms of uh, President Barack Obama being the first Democratic president, not only the first Democratic president, this would be the first time any president has been able to tackle actually cutting Social Security or harming it in any way. The last major attempt to to change Social Security was done by uh, George W. Bush, who mm -hmm. sought to privatize Social Security accounts, meaning that your Social Security would be a private account that you could invest in the market. And as you know, if you had done that before the 2008 uh, downturn and the market crashed, it would have been a disaster. It would have been a nightmare for the majority of seniors because your money would have been tied to, you know, the Dow, which was falling, you know, precipitously. Mm -hmm. So um, even Republicans themselves, a lot of people don't know that in the budget negotiations that came up, that resulted in the January deal that uh, Obama made with the Republicans, 
uh, John McCain was afraid that trying to cut Social Security in the face of extending the Bush tax cuts would be such a bad public relations move for Republicans that he took, John McCain, a Republican, took Social Security off the table and protected it from Barack Obama. Literally, you can find it, you do look at the records, there's, there's all kinds, of, I mean, this is, you know, you can check this online. I think there's an article in the Washington Post that talks about this, about how the Republicans have actually been weary of attacking Social Security because it's a popular program even amongst seniors in the Republican Party, a seniors who support the Republican Party. So uh, the fact that Barack Obama is taking this, this program on in this way is not surprising because if anyone who's uh, been studying the Obama presidency in his political life. In 2007, there's a YouTube, and I suggest you link to the YouTube when you post this video. In 2007, there was an interview with Barack Obama and George Stephanopoulos, and George Stephanopoulos asked him point blank, you know, are you willing to put anything and everything on the table to fix Social Security? And he said, everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. Raising the retirement age, which disadvantages poor and working class people, because the, the only people who are increased in life, life expect, increasing in life expectancy are actually the affluent. Uh, he said, uh, means that so basically, in other words, he was saying he will do anything to cut or affect Social Security, which has a $2.7 trillion surplus, which, uh, as, as the, the video that you put up by former Clinton administrator, uh, Robert Reich, uh, former Clinton administration, uh, labor secretary said that, two, that Social Security is solving at least till 2033. Yeah. And, 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 and let me just, let me just, let me just add one thing. Yes. Let me just people in, in just just in terms of helping people to understand what a stark contrast this is. People don't understand that Barack Obama, President Obama, right now in this proposal, is to the right of Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan's budget yes. plan, which has been much maligned by people on the left, doesn't include a plan to cut Social Security any of that. It's not in Paul Ryan's budget. So even Paul Ryan, you know, who is the darling of the right, isn't going there. So I just wanted to add that to what you're saying. But continue, Pascal. Yeah, so the point I'm trying to say is that the notion that this move to cut Social Security and cut entitlements is a product of one, the economic downturn, or two, the fiscal cliff negotiations, or, 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 or three, the debt ceiling negotiations, or four, the sequester, is absolutely wrong, and I would be bold enough to say a lie, because since, since President Obama initiated his political move to ascend to the White House, since 2007, he has stated that cutting entitlements is on his agenda. That is his mantra. That is his agenda. That is his marching orders to be the first president in American history, Democrat or Republican, to take an axe to entitlements that have worked and secured quality of life for Americans for over 50 years since the New Deal that have been cherished and protected many people's lives in this country from destitute poverty, that he will be the first president in American history to take those to the chopping block. And if this does not wake people up who claim to be Obama supporters, who, who shield and say, well, that's my president. Why are you talking about my president? Now, this has nothing to do with Republicans. Go check out the YouTube from 2007 where he's interviewed by George Stephanopoulos, Stephanopoulos saying that everything is on the table. Go check out. There's a, there's a wonderful YouTube called uh, Cuts to Entitlements from the Cuts to Entitlements uh, by Real News Network. Because it was a very good independent news source that talks about how when Barack Obama first came into office, one of the first group of people he met with were conservative journalists like uh, David Brooks, Charles Krautheimer, and he basically, and, uh, I remember. Um, he basically yeah, he promised them, he promised them that he would take on entitlements. What Democratic president, the first thing he does when he is about to get inaugurated, meets with a group of hardcore right-wingers and promises that he's going to do something that they couldn't do themselves and follow their marching orders. David Brooks was, was literally cheery with glee as he was saying, he's like, yeah, you know, Obama, he's definitely he's going to take on these programs. This is great. This is wonderful. This, I mean, this is documented. This is not, I'm not making this up. People can check this out. So now when you sit around, you see people say, oh, that's my president. I don't know. Those Republicans are doing all, oh my God, don't, don't, don't be talking about my president. When you hear this idiocy, this is, your president has been signing on to an agenda that's going to cut you off at the knees since he, before he even got into office. So how do you justify this support now? Because I know people of color and people who are on the economic margins know plenty of folk in their families 
moms, grandmoms, aunts, uncles, cousins who, who benefit from Social Security and Medicare. For him to be taking on these programs is egregious, it's offensive, it's disgusting, it's horrid. And it demonstrates that not only is this president signing onto an agenda that is a right-wing agenda, it is an agenda that is more detrimental than anything the right has presented in any of our political lifetimes in the last 50 years by far. All right. So at, once again, to 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 harp on the 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 the, 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 the theory put out by Glenn Ford, the Black Agenda Report, that not only is Obama not the lesser of two evils, i.e., versus Romney Obama, he is the more, more effective evil because he is doing things that no president could have done before. Out of this whole support for this new racial narrative of you know my first black president, he redeems me, he makes me feel good, he shows the world we can do things, and he gets away with doing things that if Mitt Romney had thought or even tried to do this, you would have riots in the street, you'd have Democrats and even some Republicans screaming the bloody murder that Mr. Forty Seven Percent is talking about cutting Social Security and Medicaid. By the way, isn't this the main reason why we said we didn't want Mitt Romney in the first place? Because we were so afraid of the terrible cuts and the horrible slashing of programs for the poor and the working class that he would bring on within his administration. So how can we not rallying the troops when the president we allegedly voted for and supported is doing the same thing and doing it in a much more egregious fashion? Because no one, no one seems to care because, once again, the wish fulfillment, the politics of redemption, we are being redeemed. Everyone is happy. We have a nice chocolate family in the White House with Michelle and the kids and the girls. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yay, my Black History Month fact are being fulfilled. So what's going on? Well, and I, I just want to make sure people understand because this is this is this is the silliness that we've been caught up to caught up with for some time. For a long time, people every time Obama did something and 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 went and went to the right, which is which is which is he you know which is what he does. People have always said, well, you know, it's the Republicans who are doing this. It's the Republicans who are forcing him there. And this is a perfect example. This is Obama's opening negotiating position. This is his budget. So what I what I so I think I, I'm happy that he's done this so he can take it off the table that the Republicans are always pushing to do bad things. And he's just a grown up in the room. So now I think this does expose well, him I'm as the happy, guy. I'm not happy to do it. You know, I'm, yeah, I think, well, I'm not happy that he's doing it at all. No, 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 I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy the way it's happened. It's going to happen because this Obama wanted it to happen. So I'm happy that it happened this way as opposed to him negotiating with Republicans and coming out with his hands up saying he was taken oh, hostage. Yeah. Okay. So, I, you know, yeah. so if okay. it's, yeah, so, but, but here's my question. Here's my question. You know, I think you and I have been watching Obama for, for a while and, and talking about Obama for a while. But what I want to understand is, you know, how is it that everybody, you know, is is black people true enough, but it's also white people who projected onto this guy, you know, qualities that he obviously doesn't have, beliefs that he doesn't have, that he doesn't share, you know, these liberal ideals that he doesn't share. I'm trying to understand how do we get it so wrong? Okay, in other words, your question is that, you know, what some people call the Obama deception and all this stuff, you know, the or a friend of mine calls him the brown decoy. She uses these terms to explain how does he get away with it. Well, I mean, oh, well, but the thing that people have to understand is that, sadly, in American American society, Americans do not have the time because time is, is you know, the people are working 40 hours a week. Those who are working who have jobs are trying to, to just the way in which television, entertainment, and all the whole media industrial complex works to distract you from asking questions about what policy is. It's very easy to play on Americans emotionality and their emotions. And this is not just black people. It's not just black folk who are bought into this whole kind of robot. And I understand something. I really want people to understand that this is not about an emotional attack of Obama. Obama is evil. It's not. Mm -hmm. He is basically a symbol of a policy agenda that is basically very dangerous. It's beyond him as a person. He is just carrying on the marching orders of this agenda. And the particularity of the narrative of his presidency and his race, the, 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 the family, the whole image, the whole package, if you will, is the allure of it is not accidental. The allure of it works as an effective anesthesia to the consciousness of the American people in challenging policy that are so detrimental to them because they are sucked into the emotional moment of the first black president because of the, the tortured racial history that America has had. And this is probably one of the most shrewd political ploys by the establishment forces in this country, you know, which I traditionally call the status quo, you know, big 
finance, the large corporate sectors, uh, the, the military, industrial complex, oil, oil lobby. It's, mm-hmm. it's very true in this age of identity politics and diversity, which the, which the change in demographics of American society, that we now have brown faces in high places and mercenary spaces doing things that we would be outraged if people who are white and conservative, or even sometimes white and Democrat would do, but because now we are diversifying, we have the tanning of America, it's, it's convenient for the establishment that we have brown folk, tan folk, women folk who are, who are willing to implement their, you know, their, their, their really, really damaging policy. Because it's a convenient way to make everyone feel like we're all part of the same Death Star. You know, sky, flying through the sky, zapping planets. Because you have brown, brown people at the helm. If you think about the Democratic Convention, it was basically like you know, you know, the United Colors of Benetton. It's like, yes, look at us, we're diverse. Yes, and now less than you know, six months down the line, yes, we're going to cut your Social Security. Yes, we're going to cut your Medicare. Yes, mm-hmm. you know, we still sequester, sequester. What happened to all that? All that? Oh, diversity, wonderful. You know, we feel good. You know, mm-hmm. we feel good because. Uh, you know, you have black people now on social media talking about, I can't believe President Obama doesn't have more racial diversity in his cabinet. Who cares if he doesn't have racial diversity in his cabinet when his, his policies are affecting our communities adversely? This whole kind of ridiculous notion that just because I have a brown face or a female face or a person of this particular ethnicity in, uh, uh, involved in policies that are destroying me, it makes me feel better. And that's some way a fair exchange for actual progressive policies that improve the quality of our lives. So we can say that, hey, he got four or five black folk on his cabinet. He wasn't that bad. This is the worst of identity politics. This is the worst the worst legacy that has been perverted of our quote-unquote civil rights movement that has been effectively used, quite frankly, most effectively, by the corporatized Democratic Party. Because Republicans, when they can do their little attempts, their pathetic pedestrian attempts at diversity, they get you, you know, you get your, uh, you know, your, your brown folk like uh, Mr. 99% and, you know, Herman Cain, you know, that, that stuff doesn't fly. People see that's it's transparent. Real, the, the, the idiocy of those attempts are quite clear. They never engender real sympathy by the masses of people because it's, it's, it's the degree to which they are selling out interests that supposedly represent communities they come from is, is, is clear. What happens that Democrats, because they are able to use this illusion of their historical dedication to the working class poor, poor which was once sincere that came about out of the New Deal, which was a product of responding to an economic condition, that they're able to play on this legacy that hasn't been the case for over 25 years with Democrats. And when Bill Clinton was, you know, he Repeal key parts of Glass Steagall. He said he signed the Commodities Futures and Modernization, Modernization Act, which created this whole commodities bubble we have. You know, you know, uh, he, he, AFDC destroyed uh, welfare as we knew it. He, in, you know, the Clinton Crime Bill put more black men in prison than any president even before him in recent history. So this notion that the Democrats are better for you just because you know they have this history going back to FDR and Lyndon Johnson is a lie. It is an illusion. It's a con game. Neither one of these parties are out for your interests until you pressure them to do what needs to be done to serve your interests in the best way possible. And the reason to answer your question of why even white liberals and progressives, people who traditionally would have known better, have been in, in, in a totally in, invoked into believing in this with Obama is that it's not just Obama. The same thing happened under Clinton. There's a great article by Adolf Free that I know we're bringing up again. People are tired of hearing me talk about called Liberals I Do Despise. And in that article, he talks about how all these, you know, latte drinking, scone eating white liberals who were down in the 60s were shielding Bill Clinton when he was cutting Social Security and doing all these vile things like the Clinton, the Clinton crime bill. And how these are the type of liberals that are the most offensive because they will still claim on all this progressive rhetoric and all this crypto all that you know, try to claim a patina of, of, of progressivism and caring for you, and at the same time they'll, they'll, they'll sign on to policies that are more damaging and more dangerous than Republicans because they use the illusion and the pretext of that progressive history as, as a smokescreen to slide you a me and knock you out for policies that are going to destroy your community. And the Democrats have been doing this for quite a while. It was started with Clinton, it even started before Clinton because you know Carter was decent, but he, there was that, that right would shift. He was not as progressive as many people thought as well. But that rightward ship was taken to light speed by the Clinton administration. And Barack Obama has basically copied that. Clinton, the Clinton presidency is the floor plan for Barack Obama's presidency. But he takes it up to a high degree. So once again, I want people to realize this is just not about Obama. This is what has become of American politics, both on the quote-unquote left or right. There is no left or right. It's right and less right. That's basically where we are right now. Mm-hmm. This is He has basically signed on to an agenda that was put in place even before he got here. He just takes it and, and 
brings it to a level that's more sophisticated because the narrative and the emotionality of his particular situation as, you know, the quote-unquote first black president with, you know, a lovely wife with the wonderful arms and the cute kids and the wonderful girls. She can do the Dougie, make everyone feel good, la, 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 it's nice, it's nice, makes it easier for them to implement this deadly bone crushing policy. And people are not, people need to wake up, they need to realize that we need to give ourselves the political education, as we said before in our last video, to challenge the status quo establishment agenda with effective oppositional politics that must be done. Because these people, the global agenda is neoliberal privatization, mass hoarding of wealth by the corporate forces, uh, and global austerity, making the majority of working class and lower middle class people and poor people in the world pay for the 20 to 40 trillion dollars of wealth that was eviscerated by these Wall Street parasites over the last four or five years. That is what the agenda is. And if all people, not us black folks, if people who are sympathetic to the cause of people who work 12 hours a day, busting their hump just to send their kids to some level of school and improve their lives so the next generation care about what's going to happen to their lives and their future, they need to wake up and take action or else they're going to get smoked by what's coming down the chain. Well, and, and I, you know, I just, I, I, I agree with you. And the thing is, I, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, if you pay attention to what's being done as opposed to what being what's being said, you know, you can you can make a move in that right direction. It's always funny to me people say, Well the Democrats don't fight for anything. Well the Democrats do fight, but is it usually when they fight, they're just like every just like Republican, they're fighting you. Like now they're about to take on this fight, you know, about social security. They're not fighting the barons of industry, they're not fighting anybody, they're fighting regular, ordinary working people. So this idea that they're on our side and they're doing the right thing and these cuts have to happen, you know, which is the biggest lie ever. You know, know, is solvent right now. And if you want to secure it forever and ever, you just raise the payroll tax cap. So this mythology that everyone is bought into that says, you know, hey, you know, you have to do this. And by, by not supporting this, you're not being prudent. I think that's something else that we have to try to push back against. Right. As, as we're running out of time, it's a good thing you bring up that the, the notion that these are the only solution. This is, very, this is something that's very important. One of the problems with the way the media frames these issues, particularly in mainstream media, which really serves a corporatist center-right agenda, is that they frame these issues in a way that these are the only solutions, you know? Mm -hmm. In other words, these, because this is the only solution on the table. People are talking about what we have to deal with. Them. Well, first of all, Social Security doesn't even affect the deficit because it has a surplus. That's, that's off the table. But how come no one talks about the fact that Social Security, number one, if you don't know that, once you make $113,000 a year mm -hmm. at that level, that level you know, mm -hmm. Social Security payroll tax is frozen. In other words, a guy who makes a million dollars a year gets the same amount of payroll tax taken out as a guy who makes $113,000 a year. It mm -hmm. freezes at $113,000. So understand something. You make a million dollars a year. You pay the same amount of payroll tax as a guy who pays $113,000 a year. So why don't we eliminate the payroll tax cap and have you know, Warren Buffett pay into Social Security the same amount as the guy who's making $113,000, which mm -hmm. is something that people talk about all the time. Oh, my, my, my. How can we never bring that up? Mm -hmm. Because the agenda of the, of, of the establishment status quo is to crush these, power, these programs and nullify them because they want to find a means to basically, because people don't realize two-thirds, we're talking about America's debt, two-thirds of America's debt is owed to the Social Security Trust Fund and federal pensions. This notion that China is about to fork, China only owns 8% of our 14 to 15 trillion, dollars, only 8%. How is China going to foreclose on our debt when well, they only own 8%? If two-thirds of our debt are owned by Americans through the Social Security Trust Fund and through federal pensions, what, are Americans going to foreclose on America? This whole discussion of, of debt Budget deficits is a kabuki dance that the right uses all the time to try to find justification to crush these programs. And the Democrats, starting with Bill Clinton and his, and his fetish for, for budget deficits, signed on to this in the Clinton years as a means to bring this to a halt in terms of these programs that have worked and helped a quality of life for so many millions of Americans. And if there's a great YouTube that uh, you should link to where there's a oh, there's a segment people caught this ABC News caught Bill Clinton going to Paul Ryan and saying I remember that, that. After, a recent, after a recent Democratic victory, I think it was in New York, I hope the Democrats don't use this as an opportunity to fight entitlement cuts. This is out of Bill Clinton's mouth. Said he's going to Paul Ryan. This is a former president going to Paul Ryan like he's some kind of freshman coming to a coming to a rush for a fraternity. Like, hey, Paul, I really like what you're doing. Hey, I hope I hope our side doesn't do what needs to be done to stop your plans. This is disgusting. You mm -hmm. really need to link to that video. All right, this is Bill Clinton, the champ, the hero of the Democratic Party, and this is what this is where we are right now in America. 
This is what yep. we are. Saying, you know, time is, yeah, we no, I just, I just, I mean, I, I think, I think you, I think we, I think you did a great job of kind of, kind of, you know, putting it in perspective. And I just, I really hope, you know, the first key to doing anything is, is, is kind of understanding, um, you know, the electorate, understanding exactly what is happening and how exactly this discussion is being framed and framed wrongly in terms of what you believe your choices are. So I want to thank you, Pascal. Um, and until next Absolutely. week, until next week, we'll talk to y'all later. All right, appreciate. It.